Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This will be my full X-Men 97 episode 6 video. There were a whole bunch of Easter eggs, references, a bunch of big characters coming back that they were trying to make you think were dead even though we knew they were alive. So we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. A lot of table setting going on in this episode too, like just teasing really, really big storylines. They did give us a couple more clues about what was really going on behind Genosha. It's based on some comic book plot, but they're changing the comics like they did for a previous episode. So I'll talk about that when we get to that part of the episode. Careful for spoilers if you have not seen the episode yet because we'll be talking about everything. Just starting at the beginning, working our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs, WTF moments, starting with the episode title, Life Death Part 2, mostly a reference to Storm's storyline. It's the second half of her storyline of her getting her powers back. Basically showing that it was a mental block this whole time to make a Tobey Maguire Spider-Man 2 reference when he briefly lost his powers, even though technically he didn't lose them, Storm technically didn't lose her powers. It was all a lie, as she realizes at the end of the episode. But even though they were billing this as the second part of the Storm storyline, it felt like everything going on with Professor X, Landra, and the Shi'ar Empire was even bigger, like more stuff setting up for the finale. Don't fret the future. Why, Genosha was merely the beginning of a prologue, now past. They used a brand new soundtrack on the Marvel Animation logo. It sounded like a drum beat, meant to sound a little bit like a heartbeat. They changed the X-Men intro again. They've been changing it in every single episode, so no big surprise. They added a new scene of Nightcrawler with his twin swords, making it seem like he's going to become a bigger character the next couple of episodes. They kept in the scene of Cable versus Apocalypse that they added last week for important reasons, Apocalypse reasons and Cable reasons. I'll talk about that in a second too. I'm definitely starting to think that Apocalypse is tied to a lot of what happened with Genosha. Then there's a brand new scene of Nimrod exiting Master Mold, fanning the flames with some Bastion theories, also tying things back to the Apocalypse storyline because of what happens right after this. Nimrod then faces Storm, Bishop, and Wolverine from the Age of Apocalypse timeline we saw during One Man's Worth episodes of the original series. As long as your armbands are on you and functioning, you'll both exist outside of time. How long? Sorry, the charge only lasts a couple of days. Remember, these are the versions of Wolverine and Storm that had become a couple, and it was during this episode that Bishop went back in time, he was knocked back in time, the scene that they'd been using for Bishop's intros in the previous episodes too, with him falling through time. During that episode, they were also fighting Nimrod, who had just been created at the time. If you didn't watch those original episodes, Nimrod was basically a prototype, new type of sentinel that could just reform his body, basically like an ultimate sentinel that was even more powerful than Master Mold. They added the X-Factor scene back to the intro that they added in previous episodes, then removed. This is Polaris, Havoc, Cyclops' other brother, Iceman, Forge with Wolverine here. Whole bunch of Cyclops' brothers showing up in this episode. Don't worry, we'll get to Vulcan in a second because him showing up was a very big deal. There's a brand new scene of the X-Men fighting the Shi'ar Imperial Guard. I think this is meant to be from the Phoenix episodes of the original series when they all went into space. This is Gladiator, this is Titan standing next to him, Rogue and Beast enter the battle revealing Flashfire, also a member of the Imperial Guard. There's a brand new scene of Professor X and Lalandra reaching out to each other via their telepathy, which they did during the original series, then becoming a bonded couple, which they basically did throughout this episode. Like it's happened in the year that's gone by since the end of season five. And obviously, poor went out for Gambit. They remove Gambit's scene because they all think that he's dead, even though Professor X sees the vision of him at the end of the episode. Don't worry, I'll explain that too. That's like a whole separate thing, implying a whole bunch of larger machinations that I think gets into Apocalypse stuff and Mr. Sinister stuff. As confusing as that seemed, that was basically him sensing everything that's happened and will eventually happen back on Earth. They open the episode in the middle of a giant space battle between the Shi'ar Empire fighting the Kree Armada and Ronan the Accuser. They're looking for the Kree Supreme Intelligence because it sounds like the Shi'ar are trying to take over Kree space, basically. There were a lot of comments in this episode from Professor X about the Shi'ar's imperialistic ways going around conquering other worlds. I think that's basically what's going on here, like they're trying to conquer the Kree Empire. They gave Deathbird a really badass intro scene. She infiltrates Ronan's ship by literally flying through the bulkhead like it's tissue paper, showing you how powerful she is, venting a whole bunch of Kree into space. R.I.P. Red Shirts. Notice Ronan wields his universal weapon. It's the hammer that all the Accuser Corps uses. You see them in the Captain Marvel movies, like the Marvels more recently, but all the Accuser Corps use those type of hammers, not just Ronan. Notice he mocks her by calling her a pigeon. That's a reference to the Shi'ar being very bird-like. Like later, when the High Counselor is speaking to Lalandra, they talk about her when she was a hatchling, quote-unquote, like a little kid. 
The Imperial Guard bust through the other side of the bulkhead, everyone we saw in the intro basically, plus other members of their team from the comics. Gladiator, this is Flashfire here, Manta under him. The one who's actually on fire is Starbolt. This is Smasher below them. Titan, obviously the big guy. Then the small green robots, there are two of them there, if you can't tell, two different robots, is Warstar. Like, they're combined two selves. Like, when they're teamed up, they call themselves Warstar, but their different ones are named Bni and Sil. They absolutely wreck the Kree. Only Ronan is powerful enough to hold out a little while against them. But as you can see, Gladiator lays him out easily. Like, that's how powerful Gladiator is. They also reveal that Vulcan is with them, who is a super powerful Omega level mutant. Now, he wasn't featured during the original series, but Vulcan's backstory is heavily tied to the Shi'ar Empire. He gets involved in some of their bigger conflicts and bigger storylines, eventually becoming Emperor of the Shi'ar Empire. He's the third Summer's brother. He's Cyclops and Havoc's brother. He has the same mother and same father as Cyclops. Vulcan's backstory is also super twisty because they introduced him much later in the comics, and a lot of the Cyclops storyline with his father being Corsair was a retcon that happened a little bit later in the comics too. When Cyclops and Vulcan's mother was pregnant with Vulcan, they were abducted by Daken, then she wound up being killed by the Shi'ar Emperor at the time as retaliation for Corsair escaping. Vulcan's fetus was removed from her dead body, put into an incubator, and they accelerated his aging to adulthood. He winds up in a Shi'ar prison, then eventually winds up falling in with Deathbird, who convinces him to get revenge on the Shi'ar Empire by helping her take it over. So it sounds like at some point they had a version of that backstory, like something a little bit different, but a version of that backstory in the animated universe here, and he's just thrown in with her, like he's helping her. Like I said, he's an Omega-level mutant. He gets powered up in the comics even more later, but at this point, I think he's still meant to be Omega-level. He can psionically manipulate, control, absorb vast amounts of energy. In addition to traditional energy, like the electromagnetic spectrum, he can also control exotic energy, like Cyclops' optical blasts that come from the other dimension, and he can control magical energy as well, too. Basically, you see him using his powers here against the Kree, like this is him manipulating energy. Then Lalandra sends out like a galaxy-wide Shi'ar Zoom call to tell everybody that she's getting married to Professor X, who finally comes back, confirming that he's still alive. And he's walking too, but that's because of the exoskeleton. Like, we healed him, but we didn't heal him that well, like he still can't walk. Professor Charles Xavier. It does seem that they have all that advanced technology, but they can't permanently make him walk again. Like, I feel like there's a way around that. The power suit enabling him to walk is a combination of a couple different things in the comics. So this is the Shi'ar battle armor he wore in the comics and was featured here in a card game. It's also based on the Shi'ar exoskeleton he wore in the comics, which also enabled him to walk. As you do, they all freak out because she's basically telling the entire Shi'ar empire that their new emperor is going to be a human. They kind of started to touch on their relationship during the original series a little bit, but they didn't get too heavy into it. Basically, in the comics, they are each other's greatest love affair. But it's sort of this star-crossed lovers kind of scenario that you see play out in the episode, too, where he has to choose duty over love. That's also kind of the way it plays out in the classic comics, too. All the jingoism he references is them just being ultra-patriotic in their announcement to the Shi'ar Empire, hoping that it would win everyone over, which clearly it does not. The episode is actually pretty horny between this storyline, the two of them, and Storm and Forge, because during both storylines, they reference having honeymoons and just running off together to desert islands and beaches. Both couples referencing running off together and having their own little sexcations. They explain it's been about a year since the end of season five, so he's been in the Shi'ar Empire for the past year as their love affair has grown. It sounds like he's continued to try and get her to agree to come back to Earth or let him go back to Earth, which it sounds like has been a real sticking point with the Shi'ar High Council. Even though it seems like she wants him to stay in the Shi'ar Empire because she loves him, I also think that she wants the support, like he's very powerful and can also help her rule the Shi'ar Empire in a really good way. They mention the events of the Emkron Crystal, Daken trying to take over the Empire, that's all from the Phoenix arc during the original series. She mentions inviting the X-Men to their wedding. Maybe eventually they'll pay that off, but the series is meant to be pretty tragic. Like, you remember what happened during episode 5. Most of them wound up dying, like R.I.P. Gambit, even though I think that eventually he'll come back. Short term, though, very few storylines in this series actually have happy endings. Like, Storm kind of gets her version of a happy ending. She gets her powers back at the end of the episode. But it might be a long, long time before Professor X actually gets to get it on with Lalandra. Like, they actually get together for real if ever, because it's kind of the way it goes down in the comics, too. 
They also use a lot of Lalandra and Professor X's back and forth to show you that she's just as quick, just as wise as he is. To make as many mutant puns as possible, they're meant to be a true pairing of equal minds because they're both telepaths, but they're also both extremely wise. In the background, you see the bird with the fire tail meant to be a bit of a callback to the Phoenix arc from the original episodes as they use that to transition to the Storm storyline with her trying to get her powers back and then dealing with the adversary. They make it seem like Storm has accepted that the adversary is a figment of her imagination, even though I think that she understands that it is a physical entity that they do need to stop, like something that actually physically attacked them using these psychic energies. But they're using the adversary as if she kind of believes that it's meant to be a dark mirror of herself because it's speaking with her voice, like the person voicing the adversary is the same actress that voices Storm. In the comics, it is meant to be this ancient mystical entity that just feeds on other people and attacks Forge over time, like it's faced Forge many times in the past. She tries to treat Forge, they refer to his bite as a demonic bite because the adversary is demonic in nature. They also refer to it as a demon later in the episode too. It shows her all kinds of nightmares being buried alive in a coffin because claustrophobia is one of her greatest fears. They also reference it at the end of the episode when she has to crawl down the mine shaft, like I know how you hate tight spaces. Then Forge comes to trying to help her by banishing the adversary using ancient magic called desert magic that comes from a book he said that his mother practiced. Speaking of magic books, feels like something that Doctor Strange would be interested in. He's also canon to X-Men the Animated Series. He and Clea had a cameo scene. They could always come back in future episodes too. They go back to the Professor X and Lalandra storyline, making a joke about him being her pet. Makes you remember the Invincible episodes when Omni-Man was talking about Debbie being his pet, basically. I do love your mother, but she's more like a, a pet to me. Your man speaks as if I am your pet. Hmm. Not an entirely displeasing thought. But this is kind of how the Shi'ar view humans, like, oh, you're pets, you're beneath us. This person talking to Lalandra, trying to talk her out of the marriage to Professor X is Araki. He was also featured during the original series, too. He's just the advisor to whoever is the current empress or emperor. He's basically trying to sell her on the idea of tradition and stability, like please don't rock the boat and marrying a human from a totally different galaxy is really rocking the boat. Deathbird shows up to mess with them and make another play for the throne, like she has this grand plan, basically wanted to take it from her sister again. She's still pissed off about what happened during the original Phoenix arc because her sister had thrown in with Daken trying to claim the throne with him. She invokes the Shi'ar traditional ceremony, basically telling Professor X that if he wants to marry into the royal family, he has to erase all knowledge of Earth from his mind, including all his memories of the X-Men, everything that he's ever done. Gladiator tries to help him. It seems like he actually likes Professor X a little bit when they're talking about the Shi'ar gods, Shara and Kithri. This is also a bit of a sly wink back at the Phoenix Force too, because the Phoenix Force is essentially the sister of these two Shi'ar gods. He basically uses the god's backstory as a metaphor for his marriage to Lalandra, like once enemies, then got married to bring harmony to the universe. So Gladiator is basically trying to help Professor X by telling him to use their own mythology against Deathbird and the other dissenters, even though Professor X calls an audible and basically winds up holding a session of his school for gifted youngsters. When Gladiator makes fun of him, saying that his idealism is a lot like insanity, he says it reminds him of an old friend on Earth, that's Magneto, because he also thought that Professor X was kind of insane for being so idealistic. Then covering the rest of the Shi'ar storyline, like I'll cover this and then I'll talk about the Storm storyline after this. They clock that Deathbird is just making a play for the throne and that's what this test is all about. Like there's no way Professor X is going to get rid of all of his memories of Earth. So in order to go forward with the marriage, you'd have to abdicate the throne, leaving it free for Deathbird to take and she doesn't want that to happen. It turns into a bigger brawl in the High Council room. Love the way the Gladiator also laid out Deathbird, clocking her in the face. Thus also to show you how powerful he is because Deathbird is already super powerful. For whatever reason, Professor X remembers that he is probably one of the most powerful telepaths in the universe, takes everyone to school in the astral plane, another reference back to his school at the X-Mansion. His whole speech about the Shi'ar's imperialistic ways in the past harming other cultures is meant to be a parallel to what Forge was saying when he was talking about the colonists killing Native Americans, taking their land before the Civil War. Basically, the Shi'ar have been doing the same thing all across the universe. He starts to win them over, selling them on his idealism like he has started to win over Magneto on his ideas of coexistence, mentions Children of the Atom, which is a big X-Men storyline, and an X-Men game too, which is a little bit different. The original Children of the Atom storyline is basically about young versions of Cyclops, Jean Grey, the original X-Men all coming together. 
just as he gets the most bonkers WTF vision of everyone dying around him and then Gambit who transforms into a skeleton himself shooting him with the green beam energy of the wild sentinel from episode 5. I think the yellow light illuminating Gambit's head is one meant to look cool but also a reference to Cable's eye because of Cable's involvement in what's happening here. So it's basically him sensing what just happened on Genosha across the universe, everyone dying and the wild sentinel and the dead Shi'ar were meant to be part of the larger vision of who and what was behind the attack on Genosha and what it would lead to, like this dark future that Mr. Sinister references at the end of the episode. Basically realizing that things are so nuts back on Earth, he has to go back, like I cannot abandon all mutants, I have to go back and help everyone. So basically it's him sacrificing his relationship to go back and help everyone, which is kind of the way it went down in the comics. During the rest of the Storm storyline, she and Forge go to the caves, saying the US Army used to store weapons here during the Civil War, Wolverine would have fought in the Civil War. They imply their own self-loathing at the moment is what drew the adversary to them. Remember, it is an actual entity from the comics. She references Madeline Pryor because Storm wasn't around for the big reveal of the real Jean Grey, so she doesn't know anything about any of that. And Storm faces her fears again of claustrophobia this time, also just fears in general to get the cactus to heal Forge. This whole storyline was meant to be how Storm got her groove back, basically working past her web block to make a Tobey Maguire reference again, working past her mental block and she confronts the adversary again, sort of denouncing it and accesses her powers again. Like she never lost them in the first place, that's the whole idea. If it wasn't clear, she always had her powers. They give her a really badass montage of her using all her powers again, just enjoying having her powers again and she forms one of her other really famous comic book outfits around her as she's doing all this. Everybody let me know in the comments though, what is your favorite Storm suit that she's worn in the comics? I think part of the idea though is that everybody is meant to get suit upgrades by the end of the season, but some of them have already gotten their upgrades. She heals Forge, he makes a reference to a honeymoon-like getaway to a private island like Professor X was doing Lothalandra. Like I said, very horny episode in general. Just as she learns about the massacre on Genosha on TV, RIP to all those mutants and Gambit. Really sly too, on the news broadcast, they mentioned Professor X as they transitioned back to Professor X's storyline while he was holding class in the astral plane. Then they end the episode on a scene of Bolivar Trask running from Mr. Sinister. Notice he runs by a movie marquee with War of the Worlds on it, a reference to the Shi'ar Empire Earth, who claims he gave Mr. Sinister his DNA, allowing him to access Master Mold, making it sound like Mr. Sinister was at least partly responsible, if not fully responsible, for the wild sentinel attack on Genosha. When he says Genosha was merely the beginning of a prologue now past, it's a days of future past reference as in time travel, getting back to Cable, the Age of Apocalypse storyline that they referenced during the new intro scene. And even though they're using this scene to hype up Mr. Sinister as a larger villain this season, yes, he is behind a lot of what happened, but early theory here, he's just working with Apocalypse, who we also saw in the intro a couple times now with Cable, and both of them are trying to bring about this Age of Apocalypse timeline using Master Mold to create Nimrod, who we also saw in the intro, and probably eventually Bastion at some point because we've seen Bastion a couple times in the episodes. This is him in Forge's picture in his lab. So a lot of you have been theorizing that maybe Apocalypse was ultimately behind the attack on Genosha. That is possible. I think he's probably working with Mr. Sinister and this is a big time travel plot. Case in point, episode 7 is called Bright Eyes, which is a reference to Rogue from the classic series when she said, remember me, Bright Eyes, and she was talking to Cable, so it sounds like more time travel shenanigans next week. Remember me, Bright Eyes? <laughs> but they did so much table setting during the episode, so many Easter eggs and references too. If you spotted any that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments and post all your theories about what's really going on now that Mr. Sinister is involved in. Do you think it has something to do with Apocalypse and this Age of Apocalypse dark timeline? My full episode 7 video will post next week after they release it. I'll try to do a couple bonus videos before then too. There's a whole bunch of big stuff coming up. We should get a brand new Deadpool and Wolverine trailer pretty soon too. So be sure to enable alerts for my channel so you don't miss any of that. Everybody click here for that Captain America X-Men 97 trailer because he's showing up pretty soon too. And click here for all my other X-Men 97 episodes. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.